Please open your Bible to the book of Philippians, uh, the letter to the Philippians in the New Testament. Um, I want to speak to you from the fourth chapter, and we're going to read from verse 2 through to verse 9. And uh, these are, as so often is the case in Paul's letters, whenever he was writing to a church, and this is a letter that was written to a specific congregation, a specific time in history. And very often, the, the beginning of his letters is interested in, in theology of the Christian faith, and particularly the doctrine of salvation. But very quickly, um, he begins to talk about some of the practical outworking of the things that we believe. And the theme that I'm interested in today is the experience of peace and joy in the life of the Christian. The experience of peace and joy in the life of the Christian. So let me read to you from Philippians 4 verse 2. He says, I entreat Euodia and Syntyche, I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, Think about these things, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I want then to speak about the theme of peace and joy in the life of the Christian. Why do I consider this to be such an important theme? I think that as Christians, we need to be conscious of a number of factors um, that ought to challenge and exhort us. If, if there isn't a sense of peace and joy that characterizes your life uh, for the most part, I recognize that our lives are turbulent. I recognize that uh, we go through all kinds of experiences that, uh, so that our, our general uh, sense of well-being can change from day to day. But what we're talking about here is the abiding kind of default um, experience of your life, whether you're somebody who enjoys and lives in the peace of God, and therefore that that fuels your joy, and that that is something that characterizes you in your walk with Christ. Why is this such an important subject? And a very brute end of answering that, that question, one answer we can give is simply that, to recognize that this is something of a command in Scripture, that again and again in the Bible, we're called to rejoice. And it says it here at the beginning of verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. There's a sense in which um, the Christian is summoned to the life of joy and peace in a way that, therefore, um, you can say that you're, you're walking more closely to the very heart of God. And that often we, can, we need to be aware then of the reasons why we might fail to do that. The, the brute end then, there is just an element of command. There's also along with that, this aspect of the privilege that you have when you become a believer in Jesus. What, does, what has Christ accomplished for you upon the cross? Some of that can be answered in terms of the objective accomplishments of Jesus, what we understand to be our salvation, your justification, the reality that you are secure eternally. And these are things that are true about you, irrespective of your day-to-day -day emotional life. But I also am a firm believer that the privilege of being a child of God is something that can penetrate into the deepest parts of your heart, that it ought to affect the subjective, the experiential dimension of your life. And that one of the chief ways in which the experience of salvation will be marked in your life is through the enjoyment of the peace of God and the joy that he puts into you. I've heard it described this way, that perhaps before you were a Christian, you could have said that your life was surrounded with 
happy and pleasurable experiences, but at the center of your life was a desperation or even a misery. And that very often the Christian can experience something of a reversal of that circumstance, that even when the outer circumstances of your life can be full of turmoil and chaos, uncertainty and disturbance, and we've just been talking about the, the deeply uncertain experience that my co-elder Jeremy and his wife Jen have been going through in recent weeks with regard to the pregnancy of Esther. Your life can be surrounded by disturbance, but at the center of your life is what um, has been described as a life joy. That there is a serenity and a peace and a calm that marks you at the very core of who you are. And this is the experience of salvation. It's not necessarily something that you enjoy, but it is a privilege that can be yours. You're saved objectively, no matter how you feel, but God wants you to enjoy the experience of what it means to be a child of God. It's a privilege that's yours. And let me add one other thing here to just underline how important I think this theme is for the Christian life. I think it goes right to the heart of the mission of God in and through his people, the church. What is it? that will most captivate and draw the world towards Christ? And the answer is us. It's what people see in us. It's what people see about us when we go through the various experiences of life. In other words, there is a responsibility for Christians to embody the peace and the joy of God. And it goes right to the heart of our Ability to maintain a credible faith in the eyes of a watching world. You know this in your day-to-day experiences, don't you? That if you were to, you know, if you could afford to go and employ a personal trainer to get you, finally get you into shape, right? And uh, you go and interview someone and you say, you know, uh, you go and meet them with the, the, the possibility of them becoming your, your trainer. If they walk into the room, heaving, <gasps> overweight and just unable to really move about with any ease or grace, you are not going to employ that person, are you? Or you walk into a barbershop or a hairdresser's, the first thing that you always would do is just look around at the people working there and just check that they know what they're doing when they're cutting each other's hair, first of all, before they, they cut yours. There's something, isn't it the case that if we believe in a gospel of life change, and in which the grace and peace and joy of God can be ours, then the first thing, our first priority before we tell anyone the truth is that we embody it in the way we live. I always find it an extraordinary thing. The book of Philippians, this letter to the Philippians, is probably the happiest letter in the Bible. And you can only appreciate how extraordinary that is when you know that Paul was writing this from a jail cell chained to Roman legionaries. And yet the the joy of God, the contentment that it was his in Christ, just pervades every sentence in this letter. And therefore, when he brings his letter to to a close here and begins to exhort us about the ways in which we ought to experience and enjoy the peace of God, friends, we take this on the chin as a challenge, as an exhortation, as a call, as a summons to what it is that we're called to to embody as God's children. So I want you to ask right at the outset, are you walking in this? Is this your day-to-day experience? And of course, if the answer is no, the first thing that we have to do is understand and diagnose our own hearts, like what's going wrong, and then begin to seek the solutions and the medicine that the scriptures offer. In this brief passage uh, here that I've read to you, I think that Paul puts his finger on the three chief reasons why people lack peace or lack joy in their life. And I want to just consider each of these three things in turn and the solutions and the remedies that Paul offers here. And my suspicion is that while we'll probably identify with all of them to some degree, it may be the case that as I'm explaining this to you, you feel that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about one specific area. And I want you to think about this and dwell upon it and take this as a challenge that may be something you need to do on the back of what I'm teaching to you this morning. The first, and all of these have to do with relationships. Relationships. 
But the first great aspect of our lives that we need to focus upon and which Paul focuses on here as a way of restoring peace is your relationship towards others. You see how he opens this section and says, I entreat you, Odia, I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Now, I want to just think, consider this in general before we, we, we drill in on the detail here of what it is he's telling us to do. Just think very generally about this fact. It is my experience and observation that most of the misery that we, we encounter in our day-to-day lives stems from a breakdown in relationships or inadequate experience of love and joy in relationships with others. Most of our unhappiness surrounds either conflict situations or loneliness or some deficiency relationally, doesn't it? I was, uh, this is something that's on my mind regularly as I think about the world in which we live and the culture that we are, um, that has developed here in the Western world, and particularly in recent years, and particularly also the intersection of technology into our lives in this regard. Some years ago, I came across um, a psychologist's work called Jean Twenge, and uh, Twenge is someone who looks at big data as it concerns people's day-to-day well-being. She looks at big trends across society and, and generations. And her work is really weighty because one of the things that she zeroed in on is the effects of what's happening with the youngest generation, what some people call Gen Z or iGem, and many of you are that generation, and the way in which technology is, is, is fragmenting our lives. A few years ago, she's written a few books on this subject, but a few years, years ago she wrote a lengthy article for The Atlantic called Have Smartphones Destroyed a Generation? And in that article she said this, she said, psychologically iGen or Gen Z are more vulnerable than millennials were. Rates of teen depression and suicide have skyrocketed since 2011. It's not an exaggeration to describe iGen as being on the brink of the worst mental health crisis in decades. Much of this deterioration can be traced to their phones. And what she describes there was the change in habits of kids spending so much of their time in isolation, in their rooms, on their beds, looking, staring at screens. Now, I'm not here to specifically speak into that issue, but what I do think it does is it reveals to us the absolute connection, the unbreakable connection that there is between our sense of joy, happiness, and well-being in life and our experience of of flourishing, joy-filled relationships. And that when there's a breakdown in our experience of community and love, whether at the family or beyond that, then there is inevitably a deterioration in our overall sense of well-being. This is something also that was observed in, um, you uh, you can read online later about this, but there's something called the Rosetto Effect which was uh, named after a small town in America called Rosetto. At the time, was only about 1,600 people in the mid-20th century. And uh, most of them were immigrants from Italy, had all sort of developed this, uh, th- this town together and were living together in tight community. And they were part, unintentionally, they were part of a great long-range study that had been taking place in the area among the population generally. And they were looking at health data and all this kind of stuff. And one of the things they noticed was this bizarre freak situation in this little town called Rosetto that it bucked the trend of every, every, all the other population around them in that these people in Rosetto seemed to have unusual outcomes with their health over long term. Issues that affect us normally weren't affecting them, and particularly heart disease. And they got into the question of why <clears throat> and what they discovered was that in this little town of Rosetto, um, these people were enjoying a profound sense of togetherness, that extended families lived together, that the old people were cared for by their children and grandchildren, that there was no need for social welfare. And it wasn't to do with any other cause. They were eating fried meatballs and cheese and salami and all the things that that you're supposed to be bad for you, smoking cigars and all the rest of it. And yet they were enjoying incredible health. And all of that continued until... The kind of secularized, or the, the kind of individualization of Western culture eventually took its grip on the Rosetto. The kids began to move away. There was this fragmentation of culture. And then all the health outcomes matched up with the surrounding um, areas of the USA. And I'm just offering you these things to illustrate to you how 
totally inextricable your sense of joy and peace and well-being in, in life is from your experience of loving relationships. And the two are intertwined, and the Bible shows us this all the way through. You think about the Garden of Eden, how it says of Adam and Eve that they were naked and not ashamed, which is such an evocative description primarily because what it's showing us is that there was no shame. There was no sense of hiding from one another. There was this total vulnerability and openness towards each other. And of course, within, within moments, it seems, as you're reading the book of Genesis, from the, from the experience of the fall in which shame begins to enter in and they begin to hide from God and also experience the desire to, to cover themselves and then conflict with each other, there is also, within just a matter of, of a few words, we're reading about the story of their sons and how one of the, the oldest son murders the younger brother. And you're beginning to see fragmentation creep in as a result of sin. And it seems to me that all through Scripture, whenever we're trying to understand why it is that we struggle to get along, the answer, of course, is to do with sin. It's to do with the, with the selfishness and the competitiveness and the, the isolation that our hearts put us into because we are so unbelievably prone towards sin. Wherever there is selflessness, where there, wherever there is purity of heart, wherever there's affection, wherever there's a servant heart and compassion and loyalty, you see that being healed. And yet our tendency always is towards strife and towards falling out with each other and all these kinds of things. The New Testament gives us hope, though. It tells us about how the gospel begins to reverse and fix this problem. One of my favorite passages in Scripture is the descriptions of the life of the early church in the book of Acts. The end of chapter 2 in Acts and the end of chapter 4 in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit has fallen upon the church, there are these descriptions. Luke just gives us a snapshot, a kind of Polaroid picture of what the church life was like. I'll give you just a small taste in the end of Acts 4. He says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. When we began Grace London as a church and set out to establish a new church on this side of the river, and we, a few of us had planted from across the river, for us it was an absolute non-negotiable, central aspect of what we wanted our church to be, that we would form a community. And we're always dissatisfied and unhappy if we feel that there's any fragmentation within the community or people who are not experiencing what it means to be part of the family. My exhortation to you, I know many of you have joined us since in the last four or five months and that many of you perhaps are, are even more recent than that. My exhortation to you is please, don't just sit on the sidelines and be an, an onlooker to the life of the church here. We are inviting you and calling you into the fellowship and participation that was the experience of the early church. And it has been an observation that I've seen play out time and time again in the life of this church, that wherever people remain on the fringes, they remain unhappy. But whenever there is a desire to press into community and the, the concomitant commitment that comes with that, in which you, you are here most Sundays, in which you partake in life groups midweek, there is with that the joy and the experience of fellowship that can be profoundly healing and life-changing. And this is part of the gospel, friends. This isn't a detour from the central elements of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be saved. This is what we were saved for. It's a tragedy when Christians think that their salvation is just about their personal experience of knowing God and knowing that they can know him eternally. It is that, but it's so much more. God invites you into community and to be a Christian and to stand in isolation from the community is nothing less than tragic. Now, that's fair to say is general comments on this issue. Now, when we're looking at what Paul's addressing here in the, in the letter to the Philippians, again and again through the New Testament, we realize that one of the things that threatens the enjoyment of that fellowship and community is whenever strife enters into relationships. And all too common, we can, it's all too common to see the way in which there can be feuding and fallout within churches. And this is what Paul addresses here. 
And I want to just give you a few tips from what he says in terms of enjoying the peace of God in your relationships. Perhaps if you lack peace, there is a fragmentation that's, that you've experienced. How can you fix that? The first thing that I think Paul shows us here is that you've got to recognize that you have responsibility whether you were wronged or whether the wrong was done against you or whether you per perpetrated it. He says, I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat Siki to agree in the Lord. Just imagine that you were in the Philippian church, by the way. Paul wrote these letters, and they were delivered by hand, by the hand-chosen courier. He'd send someone there. The courier would arrive, and there'd be a buzz and excitement, because that Sunday, the church would hear this letter read out loud, the whole of the letter read out loud to the congregation from their beloved apostle Paul. And he's going through and he's describing the grace of God and, and all the wonderful things that he's, he's told us in this letter to the Philippians. And then he gets to this point, and you're Euodia, you're Syntyche in the congregation, you hear your name read out loud. <laughs> or you're not them, but of course you know them because you're part of the church. At that point, nobody's snoozing. <laughs> nobody's checking their watch. Everybody's on the edge of their seat. Paul was not unafraid to address this in such a direct way. Imagine if I did that, by the way. That'd be an interesting thing. I occasionally know about some of the conflicts playing out in the life of the church. Maybe we should just make it public. Let's just talk about it on Sundays. Make church more interesting, wouldn't it? Hey. The point here is that he talks to them both. He doesn't try to sort of decide who's done what and who's wrong and who's right. But here he's very much in harmony with what Jesus says. Listen to these two verses I want to read you from the teaching of Christ. One's in Matthew 5, one's in Matthew 18. In Matthew 5, 23, he says this. If you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, so you've done the wrong, and your brother's offended with you. He says, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. And then Matthew chapter 18, he puts it like this. He says, if your brother sins against you, so in this case, they've done the wrong. He says, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. In the teaching of Jesus, if you ask, is it the person who's done the wrong or who's been, who's been wronged who ought to have responsibility for fixing the situation? His answer would be yes. Whichever one you are, it's, it's on you. Fix it. Go and be reconciled with your brother, he says. I also want you to notice, by the way, in what Paul says here, <clears throat> He says in the next line, he says, yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women. Now, we don't know who this true companion is, but obviously, whoever, when it was read, somebody, it's probably the main pastor of the church, I imagine, but they knew who he was talking to and about. And here, the point that I want you to understand is that wherever there's conflict around you, the Bible also calls us as Christians to be involved, not in a way that's busybodying, not in a way that's just trying to pry into other people's uh, stuff in a way that's unhelpful, but genuinely becoming peacemakers. In Matthew 5, again, this is something that Jesus speaks about in his letter, in his Sermon on the Mount, in the very beginning, in those lines that are called the Beatitudes. And one of those Beatitudes is when he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. A peacemaker is somebody who gets into a situation to fix relational breakdown and fragmentation. And why does he say they'll be called sons of God? And the way I understand that is because he's saying that there's going to be a family resemblance. God describes himself through Scripture as the God of peace. And God has brought about the ultimate reconciliation in terms of reconciling us to himself in the cross, in the gospel. And therefore, whenever you become a peacemaker, someone who, in seeing conflict around you, wants to bring the peace of God to that situation, then you resemble your Father in heaven. You carry the family likeness. Friends, <clears throat> there is something so important about Christians dwelling in this kind of joyful peace and harmony together. We can't be too touchy. We can't be too sensitive. We can't be too easy, easily angered or easy to take offense. I love this verse in 1 Peter chapter 4 where it says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. In other words, he says sometimes people are going to offend you and upset you. And you don't always have to go and tell them even. 
Of course, it's wonderful to do that if you cannot get over this issue. Go and confront them. Go and have it out with a person. But sometimes you can just cover it over, forgive, and forget. Love covers a multitude of sins. I want to challenge you as a, before we close this point. Brother, sister, are you someone who's living out of harmony with someone in your life and it's causing you distress? It will rob you of peace. It will steal your joy. It will consume your mind and your thoughts so that whenever this situation comes to mind, you no longer feel at rest. Christ calls you to address it. This is how we enjoy the peace and the joy of God, in relationship to others. This brings me to the second thing that Paul addresses here, which is your relationship to God himself. Now, it ought to go without saying, really, that a lack of peace and joy can stem from an interference or a breakdown in terms of your experience of your relationship with God himself, that there is something wrong there. And obviously, this has application to any of you who are not believers at all. I recognize that among us, there are people in this room who do not consider themselves to be Christian at all. And I want to just call you to pause and consider your situation for a second. There's a God who made you and who loves you. And who's designed you for a specific purpose and intention, which is to know and enjoy Him. And whenever something is, 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 is not being put to its right use, that thing cannot flourish. And this is true of you as a human. If you were called, and the most important aspect of your creation, your creation is that you should know the God who made you, if there is a breach, if there is a distance, if there is a sense in which you do not walk with and know the God who made you, you cannot know the peace that comes from God alone. This is one way in which the Bible explains our emotional state and the lack of peace that we can so often feel and what is evident all around us in society. In Romans chapter 5, Paul says, Since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the offer of the gospel. You can be justified, which is to say you can be forgiven and God can wipe away your sin, past, present, and future. All of it laid upon Jesus Christ upon the cross. And then Paul says we have peace with God. The peace to rule all other pieces in your life. The most important type of peace. The most fundamental experience of peace is to know peace with God. And that is impossible if you don't come to him and ask for forgiveness and receive the grace that's yours through Jesus, believing in Jesus. But I also know that it is possible as Christians for us to experience peace being interrupted in our lives, distorted, loss of peace. And there can be many reasons for that. I think that there is obviously the reality of ongoing sin in the life of the believer, that as much as God has accomplished a great work in you, you're not finished and for as long as there is sin in, in our lives, and there will be, then that will interrupt our experience of the peace of God. And especially if we are indulging it, if we're walking in it and walking away from God, you cannot know the peace and joy of God if that's your situation. How often we bemoan our misery and our frustration or our sense of distance from the Lord without addressing the fundamental thing the Bible says Repent, brother, sister. Get right with God again. There's sin. There's enjoying intimacy in his presence in a daily way. There's trusting him. All these things, these dimensions are important to the life of the believer, experiencing peace, knowing peace in your day-to-day -day life. But the thing that Paul zeroes in on here in the letter to the Philippians is he begins to address the issue of anxiety. And that's what I want us to think about. Anxiety, by definition, is the absence of peace and will therefore rob you of joy. And I'm not speaking necessarily here about that debilitating clinical anxiety that some people suffer with, 
I think these things are slightly above my pay grade, and I don't pretend to understand the ins and outs of this. Uh, for some folk who experience this in a truly debilitating way, I do believe that Christ can change you. I do believe that you can know healing in these areas of your life. But that perhaps needs to wait for another day for us to think and talk about. What I'm speaking about here is the, the nuisance anxiety that all of us encounter to some degree in our lives. And I've shared with you before how for many years I failed to see this in my own life. For whatever reason, I had caricatured anxiety in my mind and related it to just a few people I know and thought of it in a particular way as something that I don't experience. And it, it was really a dawning light on my own heart when I began to realize that some of the things that I was struggling with and the way in which I lacked joy in a day-to-day sense was rooted in an abiding lack of peace or anxiety that was governing my emotions to an unhealthy degree. And so I'm not speaking to you here as one unsympathetic or understanding of these issues. This is an ongoing thing for me. I have to obey the very things that I'm about to instruct you to do. I have to listen to the Word of God like you. So what I'm speaking about here is something you may not have even seen in your life. It can be characterized by a sense of heaviness by a chronic sense of stress, by sleepless nights, by a mind that's constantly whirring. It can be characterized by behaviors like procrastination or escapism or self-comfort. It can take a form of, of physical symptoms. Over time, this is true as you get older, that that anxiety will begin to show itself in your body through high blood pressure and through other chronic issues that affect us as we grow older and very often stem to this lack of peace in our hearts. I want to be clear then about what it is that the Bible tells us to do about anxiety. The Bible does not instruct us to go first to medication. And I don't want to dismiss that as something that can, is inherently wrong or unhelpful. I think that there is a place and God's grace to us can come in all kinds of ways. But one thing that is true, isn't it, about medicine of this kind is that it doesn't address the root. It doesn't answer the question, why? And therefore, we have to get to the root in order to experience permanent long-term change in our lives. Nor does Scripture instruct us to absorb the kind of secularized versions of Hinduism and Buddhism, which is so often the easy solve that people are looking for in our day and age. Mindfulness meditation or other kinds of meditation. And it actually grieves me when I see Christians who have got underdeveloped or barely developed prayer life so easily buying the myths of our culture as though this is the answer you've been looking for when you haven't even sought God in the way that you're instructed to seek him. So friends, if you ask the question, what is it the Bible tells us to do about this this nuisance, this frustration, this ongoing experience that that can plague and afflict so many of us in our day-to-day lives? The answer, Paul says, is prayer. And let me show you a few things about what he says here about prayer. Verse 6, he says, The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, he says, by prayer and supplication. The first thing you've got to understand here is that Paul says that prayer should be a comprehensive reality in your life, that your prayer life covers the full scope of your experiences. Don't be anxious about anything, which covers the largest and most overwhelming experiences of life, but it also covers the smallest troublesome issues that you face in your day-to-day life. But in everything, he says, by prayer and supplication. I think one of the problems that Christians have is so often that we we think we ought to pray about certain things and we neglect to pray about the things that are really on our hearts. Either thinking that they're too big and I don't have hope for that to be solved or too small, God's not interested in this, that or the other thing. Paul says in everything. He described his own prayer life as being without ceasing. If you ask the question, how is it that Paul could enjoy the peace and joy of God even in such horrendous circumstances that he was in 
repeatedly throughout his life, but even as he writes this letter, the answer is he, he enjoyed unbroken communion with God in everything, he says. Another thing he says here is that it's by prayer and supplication, which is to say that, it, that not all prayer will do. It's possible to pray in such a way that your, your prayer is effectively useless because you haven't really engaged your heart and mind in the action of prayer. It's more of a, a dry duty. Maybe you're just praying rote prayers or phrases that just, just fall off the tongue. Some people advocate silent prayer, and it's always mystified me. I understand that there is a place for silence before God, but silent prayer is not a thing. Prayer is something vocal. It's, some, it's, 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 it's sending words to God. And so when he says by prayer and supplication, this word supplication is when a junior person casts himself upon the mercy of a senior or more powerful person. What Paul is calling us to here is he's saying, look, you have all these concerns in your lives that are stealing your joy and making you anxious. Go to God with them very specifically and ask him for help. Cast yourself upon him. That's what supplication is. And then he also says to do this with thanksgiving. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Why is thanksgiving so essential to this experience that he's describing here? Partly, there's a negative way you can look at this, that as you're giving thanks to God, there's a sense in which your mind becomes less fixated upon the problems themselves. That bringing in thanksgiving helps put problems in their right perspective. And you understand the grace and love of God as it's been shown to you in other dimensions of your life, even if you still have a problem. Or to put this positively, you can begin to experience the answer to your prayer on the spot. That's been my experience as I sought to obey this. That as you come to God with thanksgiving, the very peace that you're seeking him for becomes yours there and then. It's not that you have to wait for an answer to your prayer, but that the answer to your prayer is being answered even in the action of prayer. And friend, I'm not saying that there, there aren't other things that you might need to address in your life. That our anxiety can also stem from unhealthy habits or, or lack of exercise or healthy relationships or all these other things and everything we need to seek the wisdom of God in every dimension of our lives but friends please don't run to that stuff if you haven't addressed the most fundamental thing which is to develop and deepen this sense of dependence upon God in prayer and he says this promise with it that the peace of God which surpasses all understanding which is to say it's a kind of irrational peace. He said it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And I think he said that with a glint in his eye because that was what people would have said of Paul. Your peace makes no sense. Look at you in the situation you're in. This is irrational to know this kind of joy. The peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds. Let me bring you to a final point here then. <clears throat> Our experience of peace is to do with our relationship with others, our relationship with God. There's also an aspect here that has to do with your relationship with yourself. And I think much loss of peace in the Christian life is down to a failure of self-governance and self-leadership. One of the fruits of the Spirit, when Paul lists them in Galatians 9, is self-control. There's a sense in which we're called and summoned to live a life that embodies the wisdom of God. And that when we fail to do that, what we're doing instead is we're walking in folly. And you can expect that when you're walking in the wisdom of God, things will go better for you. And you'll know the peace of God in your life when your life is governed by the Word of God. And that as long as you are ignoring it or doing things that are foolish, that peace will, will absence itself from your life. And what Paul does here is he gives us these two deeply practical ways in which we need to, to understand what self-governance looks like so that we can know peace. And he addresses our thoughts and our habits. He begins with thoughts. He says, finally, brothers, 
whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. This is not dry theory for Paul. He wrote his letters as, as something coming from the, the pressure of the moment, either because of situations he knew of in the churches that he was writing to or things that he was meditating upon and putting into practice in his own life. And so when you read this, you have to understand this is his own expression of how he enjoyed the peace and joy of God in the situation he was in. And he said it has a lot to do with what you pay attention to. Now, I wonder if Paul could have had any concept of the challenge of this in the modern world. I don't want to in any way minimize the challenge he faced. It wasn't like he had the luxury of going for long walks in, in woodlands and enjoying uh, barefoot strolls along beaches, enjoying the peace of God and whatever. He was chained in a damp, dank prison cell to a Roman guard. That's an intrusive reality into his life. So let's not pretend that things are worse for us. But things are different, aren't they? Back in the, mid, in the late 50s or early 60s, my grandmother bought an old tube television set, black and white television set, and it was delivered to the family home where my mom was a young girl. And on the box of this television set was written this line, let the whole world into your home. She read that sentence and sent the television straight back to the supplier. <laughs> Back then, I, my guess is there were only one or two channels on the television as well. There wasn't that much diver, di diversion, was there, or distraction, and not particularly great quality entertainment at that. And you think, how, you know, could Paul have imagined the world in which we live, in which we don't just let this thing into our home, but we let it into every nook and cranny of our lives, that our whole thoughts, our whole thought life is governed reactively by the things that control us rather than our ability to control them. So we have constant interruptions and we have constant distractions and we have unending entertainment. And our work patterns are, as, one, as Cal Newport describes, the kind of hyperactive hive mind because you're never really disconnected from your work and it's all just taking place simultaneously with people in your workplace. You think, how can a human flourish and have any governance over their thought life when their thought life is constantly intruded upon in this way. Now, I'm not here to address that theme or topic in any great detail, except to say this, friend. This is a matter of urgency, I think, and of spiritual urgency for us as believers to think about and to address. I, I just see, when I consider the general spiritual condition of Christians in our context, in our moment in history, in our part of the world. And having read enough biographies and, and church history to know that there were different eras and different times, I often feel a measure of depression at the biblical illiteracy, the lack of heavenly mindedness, the way in which we are so enculturated and I say this as much about myself, to my own shame, as about observations of us in general. And you think, friends, there is a, there is a desperate urgency, isn't there, for us to be aware that our thought lives are so important and worthy of protection. Here's how Jesus puts it in Luke 11. He said, your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light, and when it's bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. The Bible says you are responsible for yourself, friend. Make decisions that allow you to fill your heart and your mind with the good things of God, and not be a, simple, a leaf on the breeze or a twig on the surface of a river just carried along by every force that's, that's working itself out upon your life. Whatever's true, how can you fill your heart with truth? 
whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. When we're describing a lack of joy and peace in our hearts, how easily we miss the most fundamental thing. What is it that you're paying attention to all day long? Your thoughts. And he also mentions here your habits. He says, what you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. He said, the God of peace, knowing the intimacy, closeness, and emotional reality of God's peace in your life is connected with the degree to which you are walking in the habits of faith that Paul modeled for these Christians. What you've learned, received, heard, and seen in me. Does this mean that God's love is somehow conditional upon the way we're acting? Of course, the answer is absolutely not. God loves you. He is knocking at the door. He is eager to be with you in any and every circumstance. But the problem that often we face is the problem of our own hearts, that we have this opportunity to know godliness and godly habits in our lives, but we don't always take advantage of it. Just as as it can be the case, you can own a home and not live in it. Many people who you encounter who are homeless have at one stage been in that situation and have chosen not to be. Not all, of course, but that is a, a phenomenon. It's possible to have family and not see them or enjoy them, to have friends and not spend time with them. It's possible to have something that's yours and not enjoy it, and that is true for the Christian who has come into the experience of becoming a child of God but has no practical evidence in their life that they're enjoying intimacy with him on a daily basis. And so Paul says, what you've learned, received, heard and seen in me. Practice these things and then see, watch, how the God of peace will be with you. I want to just return to what I said at the start, that I think this is something of an urgency in our lives. That we are called and summoned to embody that which we preach and believe is true. And a Christian as an individual has a duty before God to examine themselves in the light of all the things I've been describing today. Your relationships with others, your prayer life, your thought life, your habits. And know that wherever there is something out of whack or out of place, you have the resources in the gospel to set it straight so that you can walk in the enjoyment of the peace of God that is yours in Christ to take responsibility for yourself and use the resources that are yours in Christ because that is what Paul points us to constantly. It's all ours in the gospel. He talks, when he's addressing the issue of relation, relation problems, he tells them to agree in the Lord. He's not saying that they can just use the right techniques here to find peace. He's saying this is yours in Christ. Christ has died that you might have in relational harmony. When he's talking about our prayer lives, he talks about about God guarding our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The peace that's yours is peace through the gospel. He says the God of peace will be with you. This is the birthright of the Christian. I know, as I said earlier, some of you are not Christian at all. And I just want to say a final word to you. Friend, what is on offer for you here and what Paul modeled to us is an experience that can be yours the moment you turn to God. And I want to encourage and urge you, perhaps this is what brought you to church in the first place. This is what you started you on a kind of spiritual journey, was an an honest look at your own life and saying, whatever I've done up to this point, it isn't working. The Lord wants to address that. And then for the majority of us who are believers in Jesus, What is it that the Lord has put his finger on today? What is it that he's called and summoned you to do? What do you need to put into practice? 
I want to urge and encourage you. Part of the Christian life is just this obedience, this imitation, this willingness to walk in the things that the Scriptures call us to. And not to be like infants, but to grow up into the maturity that's ours in Christ. I want to pray for us now. Let's bow our heads.